New details now on the human cost of the U.S. military's drone program. The Wounds of the Drone Warrior is a feature article published in the New York Times this week. It explores the journey of a former counterterrorism officer named Christopher Aaron. A.L. Press wrote that piece, and he joins me now. A.L., I want to ask you a little bit about this. It's, you write about the story of Christopher Aaron. Tell me a little bit more about him. Well, Christopher was um, an imagery and intelligence analyst in the drone program. Um, as I write in the story, he joined uh, for very ideolo idealistic reasons. Um, he really wanted to contribute to um, defeating al-Qaeda after 9-11. Um, and he served in the drone program for a couple of years. Um, and afterwards, uh, he started feeling strange effects. The first effects were a sort of physical um, flu symptoms, digestive problems, a kind of physical breakdown. He's a very sort of robust, muscular guy, and he suddenly <laughs> felt really weak. Um, and then he started experiencing psychological problems. And the article is really both about the journey he took and sort of trying to understand what these psychic wounds were, and more broadly, what the psychic wounds of people in the drone program are, which is not something we hear about very much. I mean, on the surface, when you think of it at first, is it better to be in a drone program or to be boots on the ground who are making life decisions on whether to kill someone on the ground and pull the trigger? How do you explain sort of this disconnect. We think technology is good and it's going to help us, but you're bringing us a very different picture from the military. Well, I mean, I, I don't think anyone would say it's, um, w would discount how, how difficult and risky being on the ground is, and none of the drone operators I spoke to, including Christopher, would, would make that comparison. On the other hand, there's a perception that being a drone operator is like playing a video game, yes. that it's carefree, it's impersonal, it's just pressing a button, and everything we're learning about the program and the people in it suggests that that's not true. Um, the U.S. Air Force studies I cite in the piece, for example, that three-fourths of all um, drone intelligence analysts in kill chain operations experience disruptive negative emotions after strikes, that they witness um, graphic violence more often than special forces on the ground. And you can sort of imagine why they're doing this day after day, shift after shift. But what is the cumulative toll that that takes on a person, especially when they're making life and death decisions? What is it that they say really troubles them the most? Is there one thing, one angle? Well, um, in, in the piece, I suggest that we can't really understand the wounds of drone operators in the sort of classical sense of PTSD. Yeah. PTSD is associated with brain injuries, with exposure to what they call life threat events. Drone operators don't experience those events. What they experience are a, a sense of moral confusion and inner conflict. And I talk about the concept of moral injury, that if you, if you watch or do something that goes against your core values, that can leave a very lasting emotional residue and a wound that can often be lifelong. Uh, and that's really what the piece is about. Is there hope for these people? Have they been able to reconcile that divide that they have? I think the, the, most, the most important hope they have actually is, is, is whether as a society we're willing to go beyond just the cliche of saying we support uh, people in the military and actually hear what they're going through and hear what we as a society are asking the people who fight in our name to do. Um, if we believe remote combat and technology uh, is the answer, we should have an honest picture and an honest conversation about the toll that that takes, not only on people in foreign countries who live under drones, but also on the people who are who are behind the screens. We know this concept of remote combat is only increasing. Have these sort of case scenarios also increased? Um, well, I think... I think the, the research is preliminary. Um, there's so much secrecy around the drone program that it's very rare for someone to come forward and be able to tell their story. And indeed, um, the story I tell has no classified information in it. There, there, you, you will not hear or read much about specific missions because so much is classified. But what you can get a picture of, both through the Air Force studies and through some of the accounts that I and others have told, is just the emotional and moral weight that this, this can, can have. Where do you see this headed next? Um, I think it is the future of warfare. Um, I think that, you know, I, t I spoke to people in the course of my reporting who think that um, conventional pilots are, um, are going to become obsolete. Uh, whether or not that's true, I guess, remains to be seen. But certainly, um, as a society, what that raises for us is the question of how disengaged and disconnected we all become from war making. And that can be very dangerous because it can lead to never ending war. It was just such a fascinating story that you brought to us. We're grateful you could join us. And, and also a look at technology and how we still need to continue supporting these troops even as we make these advancements. Thank you very much for having me. How grateful you could join us.